This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston in our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Good morning. Welcome to Mosaic Church. So glad you're here. Uh, Welcome if you're new, if you're visiting. uh, We'd love to connect with you. We do that through the connection card in the worship guide. If you fill it out legibly, the physical copy, and then toss it into the offering box in the back, or just uh, redeem it at the Welcome Center uh, for a gift, uh, we'll reach out to you this week. There's also a connection card in the app and on the website. With that said, would you please pray with me over the preaching of God's holy word? (coughs) Oh, sorry. Before we pray. Quick announcement. Uh, Next Friday. Not next Friday. Friday, April 2nd, we are having a Good Friday service at 6 p.m. We welcome you, and we welcome you to invite friends. Easter, we have three services. Uh, Why three services? To make room for you to invite your friends as well. Uh, We know that probably the middle service, the 1015, will be the most popular one. So don't go to that one. Go to, go to the 831 or the noon one, or, or just go to all of them. It's fine. It's okay. It's all good. Um, that, and then we are having a, another prayer uh, service tonight at 5 p.m., our second of three. Uh, so we welcome you to that as well. Would you pray with me over the preaching of God's word? Heavenly Father, what a <clears throat> good God you are. And what a great God you are. You are a holy God. And we have rebelled against you. We sinned against the holy God. We tried to dethrone you uh, by making ourselves God. That was the temptation of the evil one. That's exactly what he wanted, and he wanted that for us. So we sinned, and Lord, we recognize that what we deserved by our sin as we rebelled against you, we deserved a damnation. We deserved eternal condemnation. We deserve hell. By sitting against an eternal God, we deserve an eternal, an infinite penalty. But Lord, we thank you that you are loving, you are slow to anger, and you are gracious, and you are filled with loving kindness. Your word tells us that you are love. That is your essence. Therefore, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Jesus, that you lived the perfect life in our place, and you died on the cross The penalty that we deserve, the condemnation, the wrath, the damnation, the hell. You went through hell on the cross and you were canceled so that we would never be. So that our record of indebtedness against you could be canceled. So forgiveness could be given. And from that perspective of grace, Lord, that you are a gracious God, that you judge with grace Make us the people who receive that grace and are transformed by that grace so we can be discerning in this world, in this life, knowing the difference between good and evil, but also gracious, recognizing that any person at any moment, no matter how sinful, no matter how wicked, no matter how evil, while their heart is still beating, there is still hope for redemption through the cross of Jesus Christ. Bless our time in the Holy Scriptures, and Lord, send us the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we are in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, The Sermon on the Mount is the greatest sermon preached by the greatest preacher to have ever preached, uh, Jesus Christ. And the title of the sermon today is Don't Cancel People. That's what's happening in our culture. People are getting canceled. J.K. Rowling, Gina Carano, Michael Lindell, Goya, Mr. Potato Head, Dr. Seuss, Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben. Canceled, canceled, canceled. Donald Trump, president for four years, canceled. Even to say his name in public is to make people uncomfortable. Wrong tweet, wrong tone, wrong opinion, wrong decision, wrong word, wrong belief, wrong conviction, wrong thing, think, wrong anything. You're gone, you're canceled, unfriended, unfollowed, deplatformed, rejected, banned, banished, cast out, beyond redemption. No quarter, no clemency, no grace, banned for life forever. So how are we as Christians to respond to cancel culture? When we get canceled, the natural response is to cancel back twice as hard. 
You cancel me, I'm going to cancel you. And if we don't have the power, I'm going to cancel you in my heart, in my mind. You're gone forever. Well, how can we think through this theologically? Well, we start where Scripture starts, with the bad news that we all deserve to get canceled, to be damned forever. But thanks be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came to uncancel us. Jesus called canceled people his friends. The ostracized of society, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, the liars and the thieves. He befriended them, loved them, forgave the outcast, the misfit, the leper, the liar. He refused to dismiss those that culture dismissed. He accepted those who were rejected. He forgave the denounced. He pardoned the shamed. How? He came and lived in our place and died in our place. Jesus Christ on the cross cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why was he forsaken by the Father? Because he was canceled by the Father. Jesus Christ went through hell on the cross to save us from it. And he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, and he nailed this to the cross. From that perspective, when we receive that grace, when we receive that redemption, when we realize that we didn't deserve the, the redemption. We deserve the cancellation. We receive that. Now we look at anybody and everybody from that perspective that if your heart is still beating, there is hope for redemption no matter what you've done, no matter who you are. So from that perspective, we're going to look at Matthew 7, 1 through 12. Matthew 7, 1 through 12. Would you look at the text with me? Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to have the speck, to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who receives and the one who seeks, finds. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the reading of God's holy, inerrant, fallible, authoritative word. May he write these eternal truths upon our hearts. Three points, Christian judging, Christian asking, and Christian Loving, first Christian judging. Jesus goes from addressing our posture of heart toward money and possessions to now our posture of heart toward people and relationships, our attitudes toward people. And he starts with judging. Judge not that you be not judged. What does that mean? At face value, if you just take it by the, we need to get rid of all judgments. Is that what he's saying? Get rid of teachers, grades, coaches, umpires, referees, cops, judges, courts, accountability, responsibility. Is that what he's saying? It's not what he's saying. And if you read this in context, you see that. Because in the context, he calls us hypocrites. That's judgment. And he calls us evil. And he calls some people dogs and pigs. In the same context where he says, judge not. Jesus Christ had choice words, hard words for hard hearts. For politicians and religious authorities in particular, he called Herod a fox. He called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs and brood of vipers. Obviously, he's not saying you can't make judgment calls ever. There's no way around it. Even if you tell someone, don't judge me as they're judging you, what you're doing at that moment is you're judging, they're judging of you. There's no way around it. We all judge, we all make judgment calls. And we're actually in other texts told that we are to judge. 1 Corinthians 10, 15, I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. St. Paul says, 
discern, discern, am I preaching the truth? So we are to judge. We are to make judgment calls. Uh, don't judge. Jesus isn't saying don't think. We have to think. So now you get into uh, lexical study. You get into studying what the word means, judge, crino. It has two definitions. The first one is condemn. The second one is discern. Jesus clearly isn't saying don't discern. He's saying do not condemn as you are discerning. Do not condemn, do not put yourself in the position of God where you send people to hell, uh, judge, jury, and executioner. While people are alive, in the same way that if you're a Christian, you got redemption, you have to extend the possibility of redemption to others. Matthew 7, 6, do not give dogs what is holy, do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. He's saying dogs and pigs, these are people, these are people, who are focused on their physical appetites, that's all they have. They don't discern the spiritual. They don't discern the the value, the treasure of that which is holy. The holy thing here, he's talking about the priest that would go in and and sacrifice. And part of the sacrifice would be called the holy offering. And the other part of the sacrifice they they would take and they would eat. The holy offering, they couldn't even imagine taking that and throwing it to dogs. By dogs, he's talking about wild animals here. Because that would be a complete desecration. They don't have spiritual taste buds. They don't understand and don't have spiritual sensitivity. They don't see the value. Same thing with with the pigs. They don't see a value in the pearl because they can't eat it. Jesus in other places uh, tells his disciples, go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if the people in that village do not see the value, the preciousness, the treasure of the gospel, he says, turn around and shake off the dust from your feet and go to the next one. So there is a lesson here in terms of even discernment in how we share the gospel with people. We have to discern, is their heart open to, is there a sensitivity to the spiritual realm? Dogs and pigs, it's those who have had ample opportunity to hear, to receive the good news, but have decisively, defiantly even rejected it. That's why in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, the, the next text, Jesus says, beware. Beware of false prophets. It means there has to be discernment. False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits." So we as believers, we need to know truth. We need to know doctrine. We need to know what's true and what's not, what's good and what's evil. Hebrews 5.14 says, But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Discernment has to be trained. The scripture in other places does talk about judging, ecclesiastical judging, judging in the church. As brothers and sisters in the church, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, talks about the fact that if someone sins against you, if a Christian is living in unrepentant sin, it's our job to go to them and to speak truth in love. That's a judgment call. There's a civil government judging in Romans 13. There's private judging in terms of private relationships. So Jesus clearly isn't saying we can't judge. What does he mean? He says don't judge hypocritically. Don't judge hypocritically. And that's really what the Sermon on the Mount is, uh, Sermon on the Mount is all about. There's two ways to live. There's a way that you live where you pretend to be much more righteous than you are. Virtue signaling to absolutely everyone that you are a good person, that you are a self-righteous person. And then we do everything that we do, we do for show. And then the other way is the way of Jesus Christ, where you recognize your spiritual bankruptcy, poverty, that you are evil, that you are a dog, and that you are a pig, and that we're all hypocrites, and that we need redemption from Jesus Christ, who was the only perfect person to live. So that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Matthew 5, 20, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. It's a righteousness that comes from within, from a brand new heart that Jesus offers each one of us. So Matthew 5, 21 through 26, don't get angry like the hypocrites, but love like Jesus. The next paragraph, do not lust like the hypocrites, 
but be pure in heart like Jesus. The next paragraph, do not divorce like the hypocrites, but be faithful like Jesus. Do not lie like the hypocrites, always be truthful like Jesus. Do not retaliate like the hypocrites. Do not hate your enemies like the hypocrites. Do not practice your righteousness. Do not give to be seen. Do not pray to be seen. Do not fast to be seen. Do not lay up treasures on earth like the hypocrites. Do not be anxious about anything physical like the hypocrites. And judge not like the hypocrites. And the hypocrites, Jesus had a particular group of people in mind. It was the Pharisees. The Pharisees who would reject the law of God, create their own rules, and then pretend to live up to their own rules and judge everyone else who didn't live up to the rules like they did. And they held utter contempt to absolutely everybody who was not like them. And they wouldn't offer anybody redemption because they thought they didn't need redemption themselves. That's why Jesus tells a parable about the, a Pharisee and a tax collector that walk into the temple. The tax collector is the lowest of the low. Anyone that works for the IRS, that's you. And, and it's the IRS for the occupying force, so it's even worse. A tax collector is the worst of the worst of the worst. And the Pharisee, they come in, and the Pharisee prays out loud. He says, God, thank you that I'm not like that guy. Thank you that I'm not like the extortioners and the adulterers and the prostitutes, the unjust. Thank you that I fast twice a week and I give a tithe of everything. I Thank you that I am so much better than that guy. And then the tax collector can't even look up to the sky, beating his breast. He says, God, forgive me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that guy went home justified, forgiven, the Pharisees judged other people's sins blind to their own glaring faults. There was a condemning spirit in them, a censorious spirit, judgmental spirit. Luke 6, 37, do, judge not and you will not be judged, condemn not. So here the parallel passage, it's clarified. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So as we discern that someone is in sin, we recognize that we're sinners as well. There's no holier than thou air about us. We can receive grace. They can receive grace. Uh, we can all become children of God. John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. John 8, 15, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. So we are not to judge from a position as if we are God. We are not. Romans 14, 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Judge not hastily or rashly. We are to give others the benefit of the doubt before thinking the worst about a person. We should try to get the facts of whatever the situation is. Proverbs 18, 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Really, the emphasis is on the hypocrisy. Romans 2, 1. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you judge the because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We judge all the time. Francis Schaeffer, one of the greatest apologists of the 20th century, he said, this. he said, all God would need to condemn us a thousand times over is to put a tape recorder around our neck and then judge us according to the standards that we have set for everybody else. That would, that would be the not even God's commands. And we do this all the time. We, we, we live in a society where people judge all the time. And we're actually encouraged with the ratings and reviews of absolutely everything and everyone. Ah, oh, service wasn't that good. Four stars. Last uh, two weeks ago, we got, a, we got a one star review on Google ratings for the church. And I know exactly who it was because I had a conversation with the person and I had to tell that person something they didn't want to hear. They go home. One star review. Now, if you're listening, if you're that person, you're listening, let's have a conversation. I don't, I don't think it's fair to get I, I, three stars, I think, at least. I, I don't think that's fair. And by the way, for the rest of you, uh, really easy evangelistic work you can do today. Go on Google and give us a five-star rating to bump, bump us up. And, and the more you write, the better it is. And, and on Yelp and on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That we live in the society where we, do, we judge people all the time. If you just listen to yourself, you look at a person, just one glance, up and down, that's it. You already judged. Judge the appearance, judge the hair, judge the clothing, judge the behavior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
The hypocrisy is in that we hold ourselves to a different standard than we hold other people. And, and, this is, and, and there's a blinding to it. And that's why Jesus talks about a speck and a log in the eyes. He talks about dogs and pigs do, who don't have a spiritual sensitivity. The spiritual is imperceptible to them because there's something wrong with their eyes. And, and this is the same issue with us. And sometimes we don't even see it. We don't see how hypocritical we are ourselves. Like King David, this, this man who loved the Lord, wrote incredible psalms to the Lord, he sins egregiously, commits adultery with another man's wife and kills him. A year goes by. God sends finally Nathan the prophet to come and, and bring a word of conviction to King David. And tells him a parable about a rich man who stole a poor man's sheep. And this is 2 Samuel 12, 5 through 7. That David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. You are that man. That's the hypocrisy that blinds us to, to, to our own sin. Matthew 7, 3 through 5, this is what Jesus does with the speck and the log. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and when there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's an illustration from a carpenter's workshop. What is the speck? It's sawdust. What is it? That's sin. Every single one of us, we have sin. We have sinned. We have sins. What is the log? The log here is a beam. It's a load-carrying beam in a house. Sometimes if you want to do a renovation, you want to take a wall out in your house, you've got to bring a structural engineer in, and you've got to figure out, is this a load-bearing beam? That's what Jesus is talking about, this massive beam. You're talking about tens of thousands of times bigger than the little speck. That's the hypocrisy. That's the sin. That's the only sin that God cannot forgive. What is the only sin that God cannot forgive? That's the log. It's the log of self-righteousness. It's the log of pride. That I do not need forgiveness. And that's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees would judge everybody else because they thought they didn't need redemption. They, they, the log was so big, the log of pride, that, that they were actually the worst of all sinners. It's the worst of sin. It denies the need for redemption. And this is, this is what's at the root of cancel culture and canceling people to write people off. As if you're dead, your existence means nothing. It's literal condemnation. Self-righteousness is at the root. There's no hope for you. You're worthless. We're through with you. That's the condemnation. That's the hypocrisy. So we are to judge, but we are to judge graciously, generously. The eye is incredibly vulnerable. If you get something in your eye, you know. You know the pain. And sometimes you can't take the thing out yourself. And whom do you go to? You go to someone you trust, someone who's gentle, someone who's loving. And that's what, that's what the gospel is, that Jesus Christ is the one who's most gentle, most light, most tender-hearted. He can take away that beam from my eye. How do I know? Because he took out the beam from my left eye and my right eye and your left eye and your right eye, and he was crucified upon it, upon the cross made of two beams, the beams of our, of our pride and our unrighteousness. This is the beauty of the gospel. That when we see our sin, when we see the, our, our, our hopeless situation, that we need to be canceled, that the only thing we deserve is hell. When we see that, that Jesus went through that for me, when you receive that grace, that changes absolutely everything. And now you can, you can judge grace and graciously, discern graciously and generously. Matthew 7, 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. A lot of people look at a text like this, do not be judged lest you be judged, etc. And one of the things, one of the temptations is, and, and this is, uh, we see this all the time in our culture, they say no one lives up to the standard of God. Therefore, we need to get rid of the standard. The, Jesus doesn't do that here. He says, no, 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 no. 
There is a standard. And we're all hypocrites and dogs and pigs. The only one who fulfilled that standard is Jesus Christ. The standard doesn't get removed. We have to go to Jesus, ask for forgiveness, and then he gives us the Holy Spirit to, on a daily basis, take out the specks in our own eyes, the logs in our own eyes, and then help people with their specks as well. In Matthew 7, 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. So he doesn't say, don't ever judge anybody. He says, no, 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 start with judging yourself. Judge yourself. Judge yourself a thousand times more meticulously than you judge others. And then you realize you need grace. Now you can uh, show other people grace. This is the gospel that we haven't met the standards Jesus has. Gives grace to all of us. We're all dogs and pigs in and of ourselves. And it's only at the moment when the Holy Spirit regenerates our hearts. And now we get spiritual taste buds to look at the cross and realize God is the greatest treasure. Jesus Christ is my greatest treasure. He's, the, he's the, uh, the pearl for which I can sell everything to get him. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is the concept of forgiveness assumes judgment. A lot of people want the forgiveness without the judgment. We want heaven without any idea of hell. But the concept of forgiveness means that you need to be forgiven of something. And this is the beauty of the gospel where it's both. that There is a standard. We have broken it. We've rebelled against God. We are not his children in of ourselves. Jesus has fulfilled the standard. He offers us forgiveness and he offers us the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself expressed this evaluation. He condemned, condemned repeatedly, judged, evaluated, criticized, and he did it to unmask our self-righteousness. He did it to uh, wake us up from our spiritual uh, stupor. Uh, here, the practical applications is, first of all, you gotta, you got to check yourself on a daily basis. So do I have a plank, a log? Do I have a speck? And even the speck, we don't say don't worry about the specks in our lives. They're painful. And they get in the way of seeing reality as it is. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Before the Lord's Supper, we have to examine ourselves. Lord, is there sin in my life that I don't even see? Reveal it to me. James 4, 6, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. We are to confess our sins to the Lord, but every once in a while there's a, a sin that's just lodged and it's lodged so deeply within our soul, within our heart, within our life, and we need to repent, but also it helps to tell another Christian, another brother and sister that we, we trust and to pray for me as, as I fight this. Uh, we are also to learn to take judgment. We are to, to learn to take judgment and not attack people who speak uh, truth with grace into our life. So when someone comes to you and points out sin in your life, points out things that you need to correct in your life, what's the natural reaction? Are you defensive? Are you don't judge me lest you be judged? Are, are you, is the first thing saying, well, you got your own stuff that you worry about? Or do you say, you know, what? I am a sinner. And actually, I'm so much worse than, you, than even the thing that you pointed out. And I, I do need to repent. Uh, my oldest daughter is 12. Uh, she's very smart. We have a 12-year-old at the house. When you live with someone for 12 years, they really get to know you. We got to know her, but she really got to know us. And she has a tremendous memory, and she also takes notes of all our sins, of mom and dad's sins. So we're driving the car yesterday, and, she, and we're, we got to chatting. And she's like, Mom, but you do all that thing all the time. You're such a hypocrite. Oh, we had a 12-year-old calling out our hypocrisy? You wouldn't even be alive if it wasn't for us, you little, fer <laughs> you little Pharisee. And, and I was like, Sophia, you're, you're a hypocrite too. And she's like, so are you. And I was like, I know. <laughs> I know. I am the biggest. I, I absolutely know that. I, 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 like if, I can't believe I'm a Christian. Like I, I think I'm a, a, I'm a by accident pastor and I'm a by accident Christian. This is like, I, I can't believe I'm saved. There's some people you look at, I'm like, yeah, Jesus would die for you. Me, I'm like, I can't believe Jesus would die for me. I can't believe. And so from this perspective of like surprise, surprising delight, I can't believe I'm saved. It changes the way you live. No matter how bad your life is going, you deserve hell. Like sometimes it's hell on earth, but you deserve eternal hell. 
So actually, the fact that we woke up this morning, the fact that we had a place to sleep, that we had some food to eat, I had a cup of coffee today. It was tremendous. I deserve hell. It absolutely changes the way you live, and it changes the way you take correction. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a wicked sinner. I am a dog. I am a pig. I am evil. I am a hypocrite. Jesus died for me. He saved me. He justified. Uh, I'm justified, and I can be sanctified, and, and God does that through brothers and sisters. I speak truth and grace. Uh, Psalm 141.5, let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Yet my prayer is continually against their evil deeds. Proverbs 9, 8, do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. He will love you. Why? Because it, it, it takes courage to speak truth into someone's life with love. It takes courage. Because that person, you don't know how they're going to react. But, but the wise person receives that as love. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Proverbs 25, 12, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a, is a wise reproof to a listening ear. And we are to learn to give words of truth with love and discernment. We have to speak truth into the people around us. Speak the truth of the bad news. and We're all sinners. And, and truth of the good news. Uh, and we are to do it no matter what the consequences are. No matter if we get canceled. Because you know what? We worship a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said they hated me and they're going to hate you. But it's worth it. That pain, that condemnation, that, that vitriol is worth it. Why? Because God still saves. So you get hate, 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 and then God saves a person. And that, that person getting saved, that person coming to faith, having their sins forgiven, eternity getting changed, that's worth all of the hate. And, and that's what keeps us uh, going. The second point is Christian asking, uh, Matthew 7, 7 through 11, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, for asks, receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son... Ask him for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So first he says there is a process. We ask before we seek. There's a humility. But also he says there's a tenacity. And the motivation for that tenacity to come to God over and over and over, to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, the power for that gets, we get from the fact that God is a loving father. Uh, the argument here is from less to the greater. He's saying if a human father who is sinful and selfish, and all human fathers are sinful and selfish, I thought I was selfless before I got married. And then I realized I'm really selfish. And then when I had kids, one kid after another just reveals how selfish you are just from the perspective of naps. If you have kids, no more naps ever. Zero naps for the rest of your life. Sorry. That's a self-sacrifice. We're all selfish. And he, what he's saying is human fathers who are evil. And I love how he just slips that in as the most obvious, incontrovertible fact, incontestable fact. We're evil. You who are evil. At our best, he's saying we're evil. Humans are the best when they're caring for little humans. Fathers are at the best when they're caring, providing for the needs of little children. Even at our best, we're still evil. We'll get that here. Well, what he's saying, you still provide. It's just natural to provide for your own children. You give them what they need. That's what he's saying. How much more our perfect and infinitely loving Heavenly Father, how much more does he love to give us what we need? Not always what we want. It would be a terrible thing if God always gave us what we asked for. He says we are to come to God and we are to ask and seek and knock on the basis of what? Not on the basis of our righteousness, not on the basis of our morality, moral record, not on the basis of anything we've done. Because we do deserve punishment, damnation. We don't go to God presuming upon him with presumption. We go to God recognizing that everything that we get from him is all grace. 
that we are adopted in his family as children, that he is a father who adopts us. In ourselves, that's not where we are. In ourselves, we're dogs and we're pigs. There's one passage in Matthew 15, 21, 28, where a woman who is not Jewish comes to Jesus and asks for her daughter to be, be uh, for a demon to be cast out from a daughter. And this is how it goes. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. He answered her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. What just happened? So I saw this TikTok one time. And there was a pastor on TikTok. Are pastors on TikTok? Only a certain subset, like this guy. So this guy's on TikTok, and he read this passage, and he said, Jesus was a racist. Jesus was confronted by this woman of courage who came to him and told him he's, he's a racist. And Jesus, after doing some internal work, he repented, and he grew as a human being. False. False. I don't know where you went to seminary. False. Jesus is the perfect sinless son of God. So what's going on in this situation? What's going on is this woman comes, she's suffering. And and she's suffering, but she still recognizes who Jesus is, calls him Lord. You are Lord. You are God. I can't come to you on the basis of anything in and of myself. And this isn't a question of race and that she was a Canaanite. She understands, like Jesus says, that, that everything unclean comes from the human heart, that every, sing, every single sin comes from within. Therefore, we deserve condemnation. So she doesn't come to him on the basis of her moral record, of, of her righteousness, of her race or pedigree or anything like that. She says yes. She doesn't, she doesn't even come to him on the basis of her suffering. God, you owe me. She doesn't do that. She comes with humility. She comes with an absolute real recognition of who she is before God. Yeah, I am a dog. In of myself, I, I am not sensitive to spirituality. So I'm not appealing to you, Jesus, on behalf of me. I'm appealing to you on behalf of you, on behalf of your mercy. That I know on your t- table there's so much bread that even a little crumb, that's all I want, even a little crumb is enough for me to absolutely change everything. And Jesus sees that and says, great is your, oh woman, great is your faith. And her daughter was healed. He says, be it done for you as you desire. It's, it, this is what makes us Christians. This is what changes us. And come to God and say, I am unworthy, but you are merciful. Please forgive me. And thanks be to Jesus who because of him will go from evil rebels to adopted children of God. And that changes the way that we relate to God and changes the way that we pray. You realize that the greatest thing you have in the whole universe is access to God. You can get the presence of God. So we stop praying to, to get stuff from God and we start praying to get more of God. This is like uh, Jacob wrestling with Jesus and, and he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, just holding on. Uh, scripture talks about praying with impudence. Uh, th- th- this is literally a shamelessness, a unblushing persistence to continue to, to come and, and ask and, and relentlessly, audaciously, tenac- uh, tenaciously. And God honors this persistence. He's not saying, if I say no, don't pray about this anymore. He's not saying, if you don't get what you're, uh, stop. He, he actually said, I, I honor persistence and I honor expectancy. My daughter Milana, she, she's figured out how to get things that she wants. She's figured it out. 
She's got a very loud voice, and she's very persistent. And she's, so she's the youngest of four, so she knows she's got to hustle. And the thing is, uh, we have a big family, and whenever my family gets together uh, with my, my siblings, I have four siblings, and they have kids, and the house is loud, but she knows how to get someone's attention. Yesterday I was, I was at my, uh, my dad's house, my mom and dad. She comes up to my grandpa, uh, to my dad, her grandpa. She climbs up on, on his lap, grabs him by the face, and says, it's ice cream time. She, and she's got, the, she got the same eyebrows that I got, very emotive. She got her ice cream. But more than that, she got his attention. She, she got his presence. Right? The, the, this is what he's talking about, this kind of relationship with God. And, and it's, like God honors it because you know how big of a God he is. You know how loving of a God he is. He honors that expectancy and that persistence. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Do you seek God like this with all of your heart? And Jesus says, ask, ask, seek, knock, and you'll get God. You'll get more of God. And you read the parallel passage in Luke, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then who are evil, that's us, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give, give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Holy Spirit. In my community group, everyone already knows. It's like almost cliche. When we go around prayer requests, what does Pastor John I want more of the Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit, you get everything. More of the presence of God. And third is Christian loving. This is Matthew 7, verse 12. This is the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. This is all of Christian ethics in one verse. He says, all the law and all the prophets. And this, by the way, is a concluding statement to all of the ethical teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. The rest of the passage is on true faith and, and truly knowing God. This is the greater righteousness that Jesus expects from his disciples. If you study world religion in, like, in high school or in college, what they tell you is that this wasn't new, that Jesus, he was just quoting from Confucius or from the rabbis or Athenian philosophers, which is false. This is found in the negative form in lots of ancient writings. The negative form is you don't want to get robbed, don't rob people. You don't want to get cussed out, don't cuss people out. You don't want to get slandered, don't slander people. You don't want to be hated, don't hate people. That's in the negative form. Jesus doesn't give, in the negative form, it makes sense because we're created in the image of God and the moral code is written on our hearts. It's natural to have it in the negative form. Don't do bad things to bad people, they won't do bad things to you. Jesus doesn't give it to us in the negative form. He doesn't give us the Ten Commandments in the negative form like Moses did. He comes in and he puts in the positive note. He doesn't just say don't do bad things to bad people, they won't do bad things to you. He, he says do good to people. The same good that you one, do you enjoy being loved? Then love people. Do you enjoy being appreciated and encouraged? Then appreciate and encourage people. Do you enjoy generosity? Then be generous with people. This right here is absolutely, it's not natural to us. It's not natural to seek the good of other people in the same way that we want to be treated. But that is the end goal of all of the moral law. That's an elaboration of Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it sounds nice until you live with real neighbors. Until you live with real people. Until you have real relationships with real sinners. And you realize how difficult this is. It's not just difficult. It's impossible. Not one of us can do this. Not one of us can do it perfectly. And this is why we need the gospel of Jesus Christ. To do this, you literally have to imagine that you are the other person. And this is one of the challenging, uh, most challenging things to do. Just imagine you're that person. 
It, the, the people will talk about this all the time, emotional intelligence, that you can grow in, in sympathy and empathy and stuff. But not one of us can do this perfectly because we're so focused on ourselves. There's only one who actually did this perfectly, who actually put himself in our place. That's Jesus Christ. He's the only one who absolutely fulfilled this law. He actually did for us what God expected us to do for one another and for him. Jesus did that. So Jesus is the only one. So when we recognize that we don't, he did. He did for us. That fills our heart with love. Now we can begin to do this. And we do this through the gospel and we do this through prayer. The golden rule comes after a, a passage on asking, seeking, and knocking. For what? For this. For the more important things. Not just the stuff, God, give me more stuff, but God, change my character. Make me a more loving person to you and to, to people. And, and God gives us these graces when we ask him, and he makes us more selfless, humble, so sincere. And this absolutely, this operating law, it changes absolutely every situation in life. And if people actually lived like this, we wouldn't need so many rules and laws. The more godless a society becomes, the more laws you need. The more government you need. Jesus Christ gives us the golden rule, the golden principle, the operating principle. Imagine if people really lived it. It would change everything. It would change dating. It would change marriage. Like, do I want my spouse, do I want my wife to be faithful to me 100%? Yes. So you do the same. Do I want her to be generous with, with work? Yes. Do I, do I want to back her up? Yes. Yes, definitely. You do the same. It, it changes that. It, it changes work. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I put myself in the position of my boss. Does my boss want me to work three hours a day because that's all I need to do to do my job? No. My boss wants me to work the whole time. My boss wants to that, It changes the way you work. It changes it's in dating. It changes our, like, everything. Entertainment, parenting, friendship, church membership. And it changes judging. You now begin to, to judge in the same way that you want to be judged. You think about how you want to be treated uh, when you're on the receiving end of correction. Ask, seek, knock, ask for these things. Uh, Kanye West said this. He said, I've been canceled before there was cancel culture. Actually, there was cancel culture a long time before Kanye West. There was cancel culture at the time of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ standing before Pilate. Pilate looks at the evidence and he says, I've examined this man in your presence and I have found nothing in him worthy of death, worthy of crucifixion. But they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Literally wanted to cancel God. That's the same thing that Satan wanted to do in the very beginning. Psalm 22, 16 through 20, written centuries before crucifixion was even invented as a form of execution. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and glow over me. They divided my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. He was crucified by people who did not see the treasure, the pearl, the value of the Son of God. Therefore, they crucified him. And on the cross, he still cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They're still guilty. Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. He can only forgive because he uh, took our sins upon, us, uh, upon himself. Jesus was canceled by our sin to cancel our sin. He was canceled by our guilt to cancel our guilt. He was canceled by our condemnation to cancel our condemnation. Jesus canceled the power of death to give us life. So if you are not a Christian... We welcome you. We appeal to you to repent of your sin of self-righteousness, to ask Jesus Christ to remove that log from your eye. And as Christians, may you know the joy of sin forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we discern 
graciously and generously in the same way that Jesus treats us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gospel. What a, what a great gift it is to open up your holy scriptures. Your scriptures are so powerful. They're living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of bones and of marrow, exposing our sin before you. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you, as a good doctor, you diagnose our sin. And you tell us about it in order for us to see our need for forgiveness in order to get us to the point of repentance. So we repent of sin and we pray that you make us a people who train up our taste buds for discernment, knowing what is good and what is evil, and still extend redemption, extend grace to absolutely every single one in the same way you did to us. And we pray all this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.